So today we are continuing our series called Pray Like This. As we start this new year, we are in 21 days of prayer and fasting as a church. You can get all that information on our website. There are daily devotional videos. There is a daily reading plan that we're doing together. And, and also, how do I fast? What are the ways in which I should fast? We, we want to help you with that. But we think the best way to start the year is with prayer. And, and so we are starting this year with the Lord's Prayer. Now, uh, as I've been saying throughout this series, at the beginning of 2020, God really opened my eyes to the Lord's Prayer. It was something I hadn't really thought a lot about. It was always something just kind of that we recited, and I never really saw the depth and the beauty of the prayer. But this past year, God really opened me up to that, and I began to pray the Lord's Prayer. And I developed a prayer habit based on the Lord's Prayer. In fact, uh, that is on our prayer page. If you go to the 21 Days of Prayer and Fasting page, you'll see the Lord's Prayer reading. So maybe that'll help you. Maybe that's something that you can use. But the Lord's Prayer, like where did that come from? Well, it, it's actually uh, from the disciples. They had witnessed Jesus praying, and they went to Jesus, and they said, hey, uh, could you teach us how to pray? I love that, first of all, because the disciples, like you would think they know how to pray, and if the disciples didn't know how to pray, we're all in good company. Come on, wherever you are, turn to somebody and say, we're all in good company, okay? We're all in good company. We all struggle with prayer, including the preacher sitting in this chair. I, I struggle as well. And so Jesus said, let me help you with that, and he gave him the Lord's Prayer. And I'd like for us to say this together. This is, this is the Lord's Prayer as we know it. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Or it says, stop right here a moment. I said sin. Some people say trespasses. I know it says trespasses. Other people say debt. This is where we always get tripped up in the Lord's prayer. But trespasses or debt really means sin. All right, keep reading. And, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. So as we look at the, the Lord's Prayer, I, I want us today to talk about, the, the title of my message is Needs and Necessities. Needs and Necessities. The middle of the prayer. Give us this day our daily bread. And so we want to focus on a story here that Jesus, where he shows us that God cares about your needs, he wants to meet your needs, but it's about more than just that. If you have a Bible, go to uh, Mark chapter 8, that's where I'm going to be today. Uh, Mark chapter 8, and if you are not familiar with the scriptures and you're brand new to the Bible, that's okay, I encourage you to download version, a great uh, Bible app. Mark was not one of the disciples, he was a follower of of Jesus, uh, one of the followers of the, of the disciples, and so he wrote down the accounts of people like Peter and others and, and their stories of Jesus, and then we have these. So in Mark chapter 8, many of you are probably familiar with the story of the feeding of the 5,000. This is a story that's very popular even in, in our world for those who don't even follow Jesus. They know this where Jesus fed the multitudes. What you may be less familiar with is how Jesus actually did that a couple times. He fed the 5,000, and then, uh, then you move forward a little bit, and he feeds another 4,000 people. Now, when we read this, one thing I want to put on this as a little caveat is that in the times of Scripture, they, they only counted the men. I, I don't know why. That's just the way culture was at that time. It wasn't the way the church was. It's the way culture was. And women were oppressed in that time, and, and thank God for how God has awakened us and the things that he is doing now and, and how we are leading the way in that. And, but, but there are really probably more like 10,000 people gathered, okay, 10,000 people here in the feeding of the 4,000. And the story says this in chapter 8 of Mark, verse 1. About this time, another large crowd had gathered, about 10,000, and the people ran out of food again. So they didn't learn the first time. They're like out again and like, oh, wait. And they forgot and, and they just weren't prepared. That's never happened to any of us. Jesus called his disciples and he told them, I feel sorry for these people. They have been with me for three days. They have nothing left to eat. If I send them home hungry, they will faint along the way. For some of them have come a long distance. Now his disciples said, how are we supposed to find enough food to feed them here in this wilderness? Hello, he did this before, but they don't remember. 
None of us have ever been guilty of that. Jesus said, okay, how much, how much bread do you have? So they said seven loaves. So Jesus told all the people to sit down on the ground. He took the seven loaves. He thanked God for them. He broke them into pieces. He gave them to the disciples. Stop right there. Gave them to the disciples. They're like, okay, like, well, we're going to take this and do. He's like, yeah, like, like I did before. Like, I'm going to do it again. And so the disciples, they, they took it. They distributed the bread to the crowd. They also had a few small fish that they found. So Jesus also blessed that, told the disciples to distribute that. They ate as much as they wanted. Afterward, the disciples picked up seven large baskets of leftover food. There was about 4,000 men in the crowd that day. Again, about 10,000 altogether. And Jesus sent them home after they had eaten. So I want to talk to you today again for a few minutes about needs and necessities, needs and necessities. Let's pray. God, thank you for this moment all over this city, gathered even in other states and other countries right now as we gather in neighborhoods with our friends, our family, coworkers, neighbors. Would you just speak to us collectively together as your body, we pray in Jesus' name. And wherever you are, say amen. Well, when you go to the grocery store, uh, are you the kind of person that uh, writes everything down uh, or do you have the list in your head? W- which one are you, okay? Just kind of, I, I realize you're in your neighborhood gathering, but just with, as you gather with everyone, show of hands, how many of you write down your list? Okay, look around, you see who's written down the list, okay? How many, how many of you have written down the list in your head? Like you got it in your head, okay? Yeah, okay, I used to be the head guy. I, I used to be the, I got it, I know what I'm supposed to get. I'm supposed to get milk, pepperoni, some Cheez-Its, and some antacids. Uh, The antacids for the Cheez-Its and and the pepperoni. And then you go to the store, and when you got it in your head, what happens? You, You don't got it. You're like, I got it. You get all the way home, and you unpack, and you go, where's the Cheez-Its? Because you forgot. I I have been there. And so I decided a couple years ago, you know, I'm going to be disciplined. I'm going to start writing things down. Laura and I found this is a a great way we can share on our phones. We can share our grocery list together, which has been amazing. I I can tell you this, we share a list, but we don't share shopping. We, We do not shop together. I I don't get that. I, I go to the store and I watch couples they are shopping together like it's date night. Like they got, both of them, they both have hands on the carts and they're like this. They're just like, oh yeah, this is special, this is amazing. And then, would you like frozen peas? Or, or what, what do you want? Do you want okra, fried okra, or do you want peas? I don't care, I'm just happy to be with you. This is amazing. That would never happen with Laura and I shopping together. We have tried shopping together. I can tell you right now, the secret to 36 years of wedding bliss for Laura and I, Celeste, hope you're paying attention to this one. This is the secret to, we- to a wedded bliss. Don't shop together, okay? Because there's a reason for that. Because ladies, most of y'all, when you shop, what do you do? You linger. Because it's an experience. Oh, it's just amazing. I mean, just all of the colors and the opportunities and the clearance and the expl- exploration and, oh, look at the different deals. And what does that package say? And look how it's packaged. Oh, it's the, guys never shop like that. <laughs> For guys, come on, you guys, you know what we do? Divide and conquer. I guess what we do. And it starts in the parking lot. Like, you're, like when you drive onto that parking lot, you're like, you're immediately thinking. First thing a guy's thinking is, I ain't driving by the doors. Because if you drive by the doors, what's going to happen? Somebody's going to walk out. Walk out those doors. And you're going to have to slow down. And then they go, oh, you go for it. No, no. Oh, no, you, please, please. So you go. You go first, you know. Now you got to find the right spot to park because you need, you need your exit strategy. Then you go in, and I've got it mapped out. I got my list categorized, okay? Because I'm gonna divide. I'm gonna. I know where everything is. I'm strategic in how I'm going. I'm like, lady, get your cart out of my way. You're coming the wrong way. You're supposed to be. Do you not know how traffic works out there on the road? Why are you in this side? You need to get on that side. I mean, I've got. I got to get in. I. Get, I would do amazing on that shopping spree show. I'm telling you, I would take home the ten grand because every time, I'm trying to beat my best time. I'm like, seven minutes, 43 seconds, through the checkered tape. That's how I walk out of the store. I mean, it's, it's amazing. I mean, I want to divide and conquer. Now, when we look at the Lord's Prayer here, right in the middle of the Lord's Prayer, Jesus reminds us that God cares and God wants to meet your needs. What does he say? Give us this day 
our daily bread. It's in the middle of the prayer. It's not on the front of the prayer. It's, it's in the middle of the prayer. But come on, how often, if not all, most of the time, do we jump right to the middle of the prayer and we go right to our shopping list of needs? I mean, I check, I need this God, check, I need this God, check, I need this. I mean, most of us are not lingering. Most of us, when it comes to prayer, it's not an experience. The truth is, most of the time, it's divide and conquer. I need God to, to meet my needs. But, but prayer was never meant to be transactional. Prayer was meant to be relational. That's, that's why Jesus told us to pray this way. It's why he starts with this idea of saying, our Father. It, it's relational. And, and then he says, I do care about your needs. I want to meet your needs. But I'd like for you to write this down because this is what's so important about prayer that often we forget. Prayer is an invitation to meet with the one who meets my needs. Prayer is an invitation to meet with the one who meets my needs. Like we see this in the feeding of the 4,000. That this... This miracle, this feeding of these people was about more than just filling up their stomachs. Look back at the story in in verse 1. It says this, about this time another large crowd had gathered and people, they, they what, say it with me, they what, ran out of food again. This happened before, the the feeding of the the 5,000, yet they ran out of food again. Have you, have you ever been there? You ever feel like you just got through one problem only to have another problem rear its ugly head? Like I just, you're like, yeah, and then right behind it comes something else. <laughs> Recently I was telling you about fixing my truck and my truck needed some repairs and God miraculously provided. I fixed the truck, not but two or three days later, Laura walks in the house and she goes, hey, uh, check engine lights on on my car. <sighs> and so I went out and I just pulled the fuse, problem solved. Uh, but no, I didn't do that. In those moments, come on, don't you, does, is that discouraging? Isn't it frustrating? I'm frustrated. That doesn't doubt kind of creep in? You're like, God, come on, I, hello, I, I, I'm following you. Hello, I'm, I, I'm with you and and yet, some, why is this continuing to happen? Just because you follow Jesus doesn't mean you will never be in need. This story plays that out. These people, they were with Jesus, <laughs> yet they, they were in need. They ran out of food. They were hungry. The writer of Hebrews, in, in Hebrews chapter 10, he really helps us with this. He talks about how the followers of Jesus in, in that time when he wrote that letter, they were under great persecution. They were suffering. He talks, talks about they were going through ridicule. They were beaten. They were thrown in jail. They, what they had, what they owned was taken from them. But the writer of Hebrews writes to encourage the church, and I believe he's writing to encourage us as well when he wrote these words, so do not throw away this what? Say it with me. Confident trust in the Lord. Come on, turn to somebody in your gathering and say, you can have confidence in Christ. You can have confidence in Christ. But how often is our confidence tested in chaos? Right now. I mean, we're all, we all are finding out where we are at. I mean, this is, this is a volatile time. This is a, a difficult time. And I think if we're all honest, we've all had our confidence rocked at one time or another in this past year. I'm curious, what's rocked your confidence? Think about it. What is it in the last year? What's, what's been the thing that's kind of shaken you a little bit? I'd like for you to take a moment. I want you to share that in your neighborhood gathering. What has rocked your confidence? Right now, confidence is being shaken. Your faith is being tested. 
this is actually a good thing because you are finding out where you are at in your relationship with Christ. The higher the confidence, the closer you are with Christ. That's just super easy to remember. The higher my confidence, the closer I am with Christ. This is, Jesus, he could have provided food before it was needed. Like in this story, he, he could have. So why did he wait? I tell you, it wasn't so he could show off. It's not like Jesus was like, hey, I'm going to perform a little magic show here, you know, nothing up my sleeve for my next trick. Bring! No, no. Jesus was doing this because he wanted to display the glory and the power of God. He was wanting to remind the people once again what he had done before. He's trying to show them again. It's not about me just providing for your needs, but I'm trying to show you I am the answer for everything you could ever need. Look to me. Trust in me. I am the one who will be there for you. I will take care of you. Write this down. God uses my needs to remind me of my need for him. God uses my needs to remind me of my need for him. Come on, turn to somebody in your neighborhood gathering right now and tell them, say, hey, you need some Jesus. You you need, you need some, you need some Jesus. I tell you, a little hunger is a good thing. Right now, we're in the middle of 21 days of prayer and fasting. And and I've been talking to so many of you who've been fasting. Some people are on a 21-day Daniel fast, eating nothing but fruits, vegetables, and salads, and and, and and they're getting hungry. I talked to a good friend of mine last week, and he said, Brad, I gotta be honest. I love food, and food loves me. And the point is, like, when you fast, you get hungry. It reminds you. But what does it do when you're fasting every single time? oh yeah, I'm doing this because I'm submitting myself to God. Oh yeah, I'm doing this because I'm reminding myself God supplies for all of my needs. Little hunger never hurt. But just because you're hungry, just because you're in need, doesn't mean that God doesn't care. You may be in great need right now. He sees you, he knows your need, and he cares. Look, look what it says in verse three. It, Jesus said these words, if I send them home hungry, come on, say it with me, what? They will faint along the way. When I was a kid, we lived in Colorado, and because of the altitude, if I, if I would stand up too quick, I would black out, and I would face plant into the carpet every single time. So I had to be so careful. Can I tell you, God doesn't want you to face plant, nor will he let you face plant. God is is there for you. Jesus says, I will not let you faint along the way. He will provide the strength you need for the journey. Turn to somebody, encourage them right now, and say, God is providing what you need. God is providing what you need. But it may not look the way you think. See, we, we are focused on physical needs. That's all we're thinking about is, is the physical. But God, he cares about so much more than that. God cares about your heart, your soul, your mind, and your body. He, he wants all for you. He wants, he wants to meet all of your needs. Just in this past week, talking to different people, you heard Marion Snowbarger. Marion, I know you're watching right now in your neighborhood gathering and you have really been a testimony to your group and to our body. I mean, losing, losing your wife 65 years. And Lauren, I, like we're halfway there. I don't even imagine what that loss is like for you, but you just shared so beautifully that what God has provided for you is the presence of his grace. His grace has been present. Last week, we talked to Josh and Courtney Korn. Josh, who had to go through his second brain surgery, cancer rearing its ugly head again. But, he, but over and over again, they talk about the presence of God's peace in the midst of that. I was talking to uh, Todd Guy. Todd lost his job last year in the middle of uh, the economic downturn, still does not have a job. When I was talking to him, Todd is in his neighborhood gathering right now. Todd said, I feel like, Brad, I'm playing dodgeball. I'm getting hit from everywhere. But he talked about how the presence of God's compassion and love has been so close to him. The intimacy he has experienced with God has been so powerful. 
Write this down. The greatest gift that God provides is not his provision. The greatest gift that God provides is not his provision. It's his presence. The greatest gift that God provides is not his provision. It's his presence. So how do we stay confident in the midst of chaos? That's what we want to know. I want to give you some things here real quickly, and I'll give you some things to write down that I I think are very practical and I think will help you. And we get some answers here. The the disciples, they were kind of asking the same thing. Look at verse 4. His disciples said this. How are we supposed to find enough food to feed them out here in the wilderness? Come on, we're asking the same thing. God, how am I supposed to make these needs? How am I supposed to meet these needs? How am I supposed to make ends meet? How am I supposed to do this? How am I supposed to find this? How am I supposed to get to this? We're all asking that question. And remember, don't forget, they're looking around and they're in the middle of a wilderness. They have no food and there's like 10,000 people. And again, they've completely forgotten. This is the disciples completely forgot how God had fed miraculously almost 20,000 people just recently. When you're in a wilderness, it's easy to forget how God has provided, is it not? I mean, it is so easy to forget the miracles that God has done. Exodus chapter 15, we see this over and over, by the way, in Scripture. And in Exodus chapter 15, there's the miraculous story just right prior to this we all know about, and that is the Egyptians freed the Israelites. The, God did this incredible miracle, the greatest miracle probably maybe in Scripture, parted the sea. They go through the sea, get on the other side. They're in the wilderness. They're in the wilderness. They're only three days in the wilderness, three days, and they're thirsty. And they start complaining. They're like, what is this? Why'd you bring us out here? What's this all about? Three, just three days before that, God had parted the Red Sea. Just three days. Here's the thing. Complaining erodes confidence every time. Complaining erodes. Turn to somebody and tell them, stop your complaining. Stop your complaining. Some of you have been wanting to tell them that for a long time. Have you not? Yeah. Stop your complaining. Because here's what, when you complain, it erodes your confidence. It, it, it creates bitterness. It, it, it breeds in you anger. It breeds doubt in you. You got of, to avoid complaining. So how do you remain confident? How do you remain confident in the middle of chaos? Write this down. Remember his miracles. Remember his miracles. You got to find a way to do this. Let me give you some practical things. If you were to look into my office, what you would see is a wall of miracles. It's, it's, I call it my wall of prayer. And, and just this week, I got up and I was looking at all these different pictures. I have pictures of different ways that God has shown up in the life of this church. And I was looking at the miracle that God did when he sold the land and, and reduced our debt over one point, like $5 million, over a million dollars taken off of our debt. Then I looked at the cell tower picture and I thought, man, God miraculously provided $400,000 for our church. I have checks on the wall. They've been cashed. These are copies, but they're checks. And I looked at those and I was reminded of the provision and the ways God provided. Uh, Pastors Eric and Sybil, Pastor Eric was leading us in worship today and his wife Sybil leads our kids ministry. They, They have a blessing board in their home. They just, anytime God answers a prayer, they put it up on the blessing board. This year, I started a generosity journal. Every time that God meets a need, I just, I write it in a, in a journal. And I, and I have a list. I just keep this. I figure out a way to remember. Listen, you got to remind yourself, he did it before, he'll do it again, my God is faithful. He did it before, he'll do it again, my God is faithful. Come on, say that with me. He did it before, he'll do it again, my God is faithful. Remember his miracles. Now, look at verse six. He took the seven loaves, thanked God for them. Now think about this. Now here, I, I got an illustration for this. All, all they had were seven loaves of, of bread. And, and just to give you an idea, for 10,000 people, seven loaves for 10,000 people, okay, just, I did the math on this. That's like, and if you divide up the slices in a, in a loaf of bread, that, that, is, that is literally one slice of bread for 71 people. <laughs> one slice of bread. For 71 people. So how do you stay confident in the midst of chaos? Write this down. Thank him for providing. Thank him 
for providing. So remember his miracles, then thank him for providing. Now, when I know when I say that, you're like, th- th- Brad, thank him for what? Like, that's why I'm praying. I, I don't have the finances. I, I don't have the food right now. I don't have gas to get to work. Thank him for what he's provided. What has God put in your hands? What's in your hands? Like, okay, you don't have gas for the car? Thank him that you have a car. You're like, you're in a job that's not providing enough resources? Say, man, God, I just thank you that, that I have a job. You don't have enough food to put on the table? Man, sit down and thank him for the table. I, I have a table to sit with with my family. Find a way. Thank him for what he has provided. And then do this. Write this down. Place it in his hands. Place it in his hands. In, in other words, it's like laying this on the word of God. I'm going to lay my needs before God. This is what the disciples did in verse 6. It says that he took the seven loaves. In other words, the disciples handed it back to Jesus. They gave it back to him and put it in his hands. And this is where you're going to trust God. I'm just going to trust him to, to provide all that I need. In God's hands, all things are possible. And then what did Jesus do? He gave it to the disciples to distribute it. Now, this is important. They could have kept it for themselves. They could have kept it for themselves, but they saw the needs around them. What did Jesus say in this prayer? Pray like this. Give us this day our daily bread. It's about all of us together. It's not a prayer just for my needs, but it's a prayer for everyone around me. Many many times our prayers don't make it out of the living room. It will be on me and my, and my family. And God's saying, I want you to pray for others. Not only pray for others, but here's the thing. I, I, I want you to remember that you are a distributor. The disciples were called to distribute the bread. God is calling you. That you are the answer to someone's prayer. You're like, Brad, but, but what has God put in your hands? Like, we've got to learn as followers of Jesus, either I trust him or I don't. This is a trust. When I say, okay, I'm going to give this away. The disciples could have said, I need to eat, so I'm not going to give this away. 2021 is not the year to hang on to what you got. 2021 is the year for generosity. Turn to somebody in your group and say, it's time to be generous. It is time to be generous. We are so blessed. God said, I put this in your hand. I want to, I want to challenge you to do this. When you see a need, meet it. Give it. Provide it. And watch how God provides for you. Verse 8 says this, they ate as much as they wanted. Think of it like this. They ate as much as they wanted. As much as they wanted. I mean, he just took it all. I mean, they just there was more than they knew what to do with. They, they had more than they did. It's, it's kind of like at the holidays, you know. It's like they all sat back. It should say this. They ate as much as they wanted, and they all took a nap. <laughs> Because that's what just happened at the holidays, wasn't it? I mean, at the holidays, it's like food multiplies. I'm like, what happened to those mashed potatoes? Like, we put them in the fridge, and it's like they expanded. Like, they don't just expand in my stomach. They expand in the refrigerator. Like, we have, there's, there's more, we got more food? I'll never forget, at Christmas time, I was, I just eaten as much as I could eat, and I was sitting on the couch, and my brother-in-law caught my eye from across the room, and he looked at me. And he grabbed a chocolate chip cookie, and he just flipped it across the room, and I caught it. And he just gave me that look, and I gave him that look, and I was like, that's right. Got room for just a little bit more. (laughs) Have you ever been, though, at a holiday gathering, and that person arrives late? You know, talking about like they just run in, and they they rush out. They're in and out, and they're, I mean, they're, they're just there. And it's like, wow, that's not what the holidays are about. It's not really about the food. It's about the people gathered around the table. It's about the people who make the food. And I think so often in prayer, you know, we're like that relative. We're like that grocery shopping. We're just going to rush in. God, here's what I need. Here's what I need you to do. And then, and then we rush out. And I think today what Jesus is trying to remind us is that, man, prayer is an invitation to meet with the one who meets my needs. In other words, Jesus is saying this, hey, just stop. Slow down. Just remember, I'm the one who meets your needs. He says, I just want to challenge you this week. When you go to pray your needs, first just stop and just, man, just thank him for what he's provided. Thank you, God, for what you have provided for me. Man, whatever it is that he has placed in your hands. Remember the miracles that he's done. Think back to the good things that he's done. And then place it back in his hands. 
And watch how God multiplies for you today.